All right, folks, uh, hopefully you can hear me now at this point. Uh, when you get a, let me make sure this is muted in here so you don't get the echo from me talking to myself. Um, anyway, so we are going to be doing a quick one run, uh, sorry, a run through of the study guide. So what we're going to do is kind of just run through the study guide key that Mrs. Kipperman posted just earlier today. Um, I would say you definitely should know the explorers. I don't know if there's going to be a lot, Megan, but uh, for sure I would definitely know them. So let me get the key over to the mirror that you guys are going to be looking at. So let's get that up. So hopefully you guys can hear me. Just, uh, just let me know for a fact that you can indeed hear me. Uh, in the chat and then we will get started here. So if you haven't already filled in your complete study guide or really any of your study guide, now would be a great opportunity to do that, to get it out and start filling in as we go over things. I'll try to kind of explain a couple concepts and things like that uh, and then we'll be done. Hopefully we'll be relatively efficient and it shouldn't be much more than half an hour or so, right? Okay. So we started off the year discussing the Renaissance, right? And the word Renaissance, as we said, actually means uh, it means birth, right? Literally, uh, and it's it ends up talking about the birth of the modern world, right? And rebirth of classical knowledge. Uh, classical knowledge is knowledge that's brought back from ancient Greece and ancient Rome, uh, and therefore the Renaissance is actually going to start. Uh, in Italy, right, where Rome is located, right? These people would look and see the remains of the Roman Empire and they'd, they'd wonder about them and it was just a natural progression of curiosity. So after the Renaissance started and all the Renaissance things we talked about are going to spread into the rest of Europe out of Italy, right? Uh, so as far as the people that we discussed for the Renaissance, we talked about Michelangelo and you should know about the Sistine Chapel and his statue of David. Uh, we talked about Leonardo da Vinci and his Mona Lisa and the Last Supper uh, and other works of art of, of da Vinci. We talked about Shakespeare and we talked about some of the plays that he wrote, right? Things like Hamlet, Romeo, Juliet, Macbeth, uh, and other sonnets and plays and things of that nature, right? Uh, we also discussed the idea of humanism uh, and Erasmus, right? So you should so be able to associate the uh, humanism, the topic of humanism, with Erasmus out of the Renaissance. So from the Renaissance, we talked about Reformation, but we'll get more into that in a second. We also talked about uh, trade in and around the year 1500, right? So we talked about the regional trade patterns uh, that had developed between the three continents that were linked around this time, right? Uh, so you're going to have Europe, Africa, and Asia, right, are the big three continents around 1500. You're eventually going to get Columbus that opens up the trade to the New World. But before that, you have a number of sea route, trade routes that we looked at, right? So in particular, you have the Trans-Saharan uh, trade route that's going to span across northern Africa through the Saharan Desert. Uh, you're going to have the northern European river routes that we, we looked at too uh, that are going to link northern Europe to the Black Sea and therefore ultimately the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, you're going to have western European trade routes uh, that are going to link Asia and Africa uh, by sea and ultimately the river. Um, and you're also going to have the South China Sea route, right? So Erasmus is mostly Megan. He is mostly Christian humanism, okay? Uh, so you should, you should for sure relate him to humanism, but also Christian humanism. Um, anyway, so the things that we're being trying to grabbed from Asia and particularly in particularly China uh, things like porcelain paper uh, the, the whole trade good right a compass and silk and tea eventually are all important things that are going to be coming from from China uh, we talked about textiles coming from India right textiles being things like cloth uh, and clothing and, and things like that right 
We also talked about the ideas of, of different sciences that are coming and being spread around uh, the areas through these trade routes. Things like astronomy and medicine, mathematics, uh, numeral systems. Um, I would say gunpowder does for sure come from, from China. I don't know if we're going to ask a question specifically about it, but it does. Um, anyway, so... Uh, as far as 1500, where else we also talked about the location of the religions, right? Christianity is going to be mostly located in Europe uh, and the Middle East. Uh, you're going to have Islam, which is going to be sorry, <sighs> focused in the Middle East uh, and eventually Southern Europe and Northern Africa. You're going to have the Spanish Moors uh, as well in Europe, which is what Southern Europe we're talking about. You're going to have Hindi Hinduism. Uh, set up shop in India and ultimately Southeast Asia. Buddhism will spread out of India and eventually uh, become prominent in China and East and Southeast Asia. Uh, and you're going to have Judaism, right? And Judaism will uh, be prominent in parts of Europe, but also the Middle East around its location. Right? So we continue our discussion about religion with the Reformation of the Catholic Church. Uh, we talked about uh, the conflicts and the challenges of the authority and of the Roman Catholic Church um, at the time. And I don't know if you just saw my cat jump off my lap. But anyway, uh, so we talked about usury, right? And this whole idea of lending money at high interest rates that the church wasn't particularly happy about. And we had these kind of um, people that were, you know, the merchants and the church kind of going back and forth in Italy. Uh, so it, Italy was the dominant country of Christianity, right? Uh, and if you remember, the nobility from Germany and England, other other European countries, were a little jealous on some level of Italy uh, and their role in the church and with the Pope and how so many popes had actually come from Italy. Uh, and the nobility in particular from these areas, Germany and England, disliked that close relationship with Italy. Uh, the if you, you know, These kingdoms were all kind of uh, competitors with one another, so effectively they weren't too thrilled about it, right? We talked about indulgences and the idea of, of paying money to the church in exchange for forgiveness of, thi of sins, which is ultimately what a number of these dissenters were looking at and um, saying that was wrong, right? This is not okay, and you have Martin Luther being the big proponent of this that's going to change everything. Uh, as far as the church is concerned, right? And Martin Luther's, Martin Luther's beliefs ultimately spread, you know, and ultimately just so that God, sorry, well, let me look, look at this again here. I'm um, having a hard time speaking for some reason. Uh, anyway, the ultimate authority of, of the church comes from the Bible. Ultimate authority of God comes from the Bible and not the Pope, right? Uh, that this whole idea of salvation is going to come through your faith alone and not necessarily... Uh, the rituals and things of, of the church, right? And that everyone is equal in the eyes of God. And he is challenging the, the Catholic Church, challenging the ideas of indulgences. Uh, and he's going to nail right that 95 theses on the wall in, in opposition to the church and kind of explaining to them at least what he sees as them doing wrong, right? And this is going to be important because it's going to begin the Protestant Reformation and the a split in the church, uh, which is never going to be able to kind of be undone. So from there, you have different Protestant groups that are going to come about, right? One in particular are Calvinists, uh, going off of the beliefs of John Calvin, who believes in things like predestination. He believes in having a strong work ethic and living a righteous life. Uh, and John Calvin's actions are going to continue to help spread Protestantism um, around Europe, right? Uh, so you have Lutheranism, you have Calvinism. Uh, you are also going to get the Church of England, right? That is going to be coming from King Henry VIII in England. Uh, if you remember the story, King Henry VIII is going to dismiss the Catholic Church's authority because he wanted to divorce his wife, who was unable to give him uh, a, a son. Uh, so he was not happy with this after numerous attempts. Uh, he wanted to divorce her. The church was kind of not happy with that. Uh, and 
ultimately he's going to say, I don't care. He's going to break from Rome. He's going to establish his own church uh, and kind of head the church himself, this national church of England, otherwise known as the Anglican Church, uh, the Church of England, right? Uh, so long story short, with all of his wives uh, and a number of, trend, number of secession issues later, uh, you are going to have Elizabeth, who is the daughter of his first wife, uh, come to the throne. Sorry, the daughter of his second wife um, come to the throne. And Elizabeth I is going to be fairly tolerant of, of people of different religions uh, because her sister, who had been in, in charge kind of before her, uh, wasn't. Uh, so this kind of toleration is going to kind of allow people to practice a little more freely in, in Europe, uh, in, sorry, in England, um, in comparison to Bloody Mary, her sister. Um, anyway, her half-sister. So she's able to defeat the Spanish Armada, uh, who is going to try to take over in England and try to invade England. Uh, and she's also going to head the Anglican Church, right? So that's things you should know about her. So the Reformation is going to spread into northern Germany, right? Uh, they were the first kind of group to convert to Protestantism because that's kind of where Martin Luther was located, right? Um, if you remember, the Habsburgs had supported uh, the Catholic Church during the Reformation, and you're going to get these, these wars that are fought between Protestants and, and Catholics, uh, in particular in what is modern-day Germany. I would say that you should know all of this stuff that's on the study guide, yes. Um, any of it's fair game, that's for sure. Uh, so it's, that's why it's here, uh, and you should know it. So uh, and we'll be coming back to it because you will be having a final later in the year too. Uh, so it's a good idea to kind of cycle back every quarter like we are doing. So these wars that go on uh, are going to last about 30 years years, right? And hence becomes known as the Thirty Years' War. All right? So, uh, other words, the Reformation in France and things like that we need to know about. We need, you should know about the Huguenots being French Calvinists, right? You should know about the Edict of Nantes, which is going to grant the French Protestants uh, freedom of worship in, in France. Uh, so that's kind of a, an important part. Uh, the later French kings are going to revoke this. Uh, you're going to have the French cardinal who's in charge and makes this kind of a political war between different uh, different kingdoms. Uh, named as Cardinal Richelieu. Uh, and if you remember, the Catholic Church is going to try to do everything in its power to put a lid on the Reformation, right? So you get what's known as the Counter-Reformation. And the Counter-Reformation is going to... Uh, the Counter Reformation is going to kind of try. The Catholic Church is going to try to continue to spread uh, around the world. They're going to try to kind of put again a lid back on on the on the uh, on Reformation and not allow it to kind of continue. So they kind of try to overturn this with what's known as the Society of Jesus, uh, which are also known as Jesuits today, right? Uh, and they hold the Council of Trent. Oh, they hold the Council of Trent which is trying to establish and, and reinforce this Catholic doctrine around uh, the world, right? So, between Reformation and between all of the wars that were going on, you are, are going to have people that kind of get fed up. Can you stop nipping me? Um, you're going to get people get fed up with it all, right? So you're going to have this kind of push towards secularism, which is kind of stepping away from uh, religious beliefs, right? Uh, and you're going to have the growth of tolerance of different religions as well, in some cases anyway, around Europe. So we did also talk about the printing press, right? And the printing press is invented by a man named Johannes Gutenberg. Uh, Gutenberg, his printing press is going to be really important because it's going to help stimulate literacy around the world. Uh, if there are books available, which previously they were not because of how difficult it was to have books transcribed, uh, it, it becomes a little more important to be able to read, right? Um, so, the 
the first major book that's going to be kind of printed is the Bible, right? And this is really important because people are going to be able to read the Bible in their home language, which is one of the big contributing factors to the Protestant Reformation in the first place, right? Uh, because they don't need to rely on the, the priests anymore, and they uh, essentially uh, can read it in their own language and interpret it in their own language, and that, that's pretty important um, for the spread of Protestantism. So let's jump into exploration, right? We talked about Francisco Pizarro. Francisco Pizarro uh, is a Spanish conquistador who is going to conquer the Incas uh, in Peru. Uh, we talked about Hernando, Hernando Cortez, and Cortez is also Spanish, and he is another conquistador who is going to conquer the Aztecs in Mexico. Uh, you have Vasco da Gama. Uh, Vasco da Gama is Portuguese, and he is going to travel around Africa to India. I would definitely know him tomorrow. Uh, because I'm pretty sure there's something about him on there. Uh, you have Ferdinand Magellan, who is Spanish, who is almost goes all the way around the world. He dies in the Philippines, but his expedition is going to continue on to be the first expedition to fully circumnavigate the globe. Uh, you're going to have Francis Drake after that, who is English. He is going to be the first English person to sail all the way around the world. Uh, you're going to have Jacques Cartier, who is French. He's going to sail to Canada and kind of claim a lot of that area for France. Uh, and then lastly, you're going to have Christopher Columbus, who is Spanish. He's going to open up the Colombian exchange. He's going to sail to uh, the Caribbean and modern-day Hispaniola. It's not Hispaniola called anymore, but it's Haiti and the Dominican Republic, uh, ultimately other places in, in, in the Caribbean, right? <sighs> Sorry, I'm tired. So anyway, you have uh, exploration. One of the big reasons it's going to get kicked off is because a lot of those land trade routes are going to be shut down, right? You have the fall of Constantinople to... That's nice of you, Sydney. Um, I'm going to leave it up. Show. Anyway, sorry. Oh, well, I mean... Magellan sailed for Spain. I believe you are correct that he is Portuguese. Uh, anyway, so you have three reasons why, right, they're interested in discovering new lands. We talked about the whole idea of God, gold, and glory, right, and natural resources and things like that, right? So this diffusion of Christianity is the God piece, right, and the glory, political and economic competition between European emperors, right? It's summarized into the God, gold, and glory we talked about, right? So we also had our little Shark Tank. Yes, Brigida, the explorer. He's the first, the first explorer's crew made it around the world. Um, we talked about we had a little Shark Tank activity, talking about different inventions, right? We talked about the compass, the caravel, uh, triangular sails, the astrolabe, and the sextant are all arid things you should know. Uh, about you should know what they did you should know where they came from I don't think you're gonna have to really worry too much about where they came from the test but anyway just generally speaking it'd be helpful to know those um, so we talked about Prince Henry the navigator right who was this kind of almost Elon Musk figure uh, although royal and noble uh, who financed exploration um, around the world, right? He That financing of the exploration uh, helped to kind of put Portugal on the map, uh, if you will, and to begin uh, a prominent role in, in exploration around the world, right? Which is where they are going to establish trading posts really all around Africa and the western coast of Africa, which brings me back to who used African slaves again, Sydney. Uh, you're going to have Portugal being the big driving factor in in uh, the slave trade, right? Because they kind of get there first. Uh, they're going to interact with those West African nations, kingdoms, if you will, um, and and such. Uh, you should know that the that Prince Henry the Navigator is Portuguese for sure. Um, so we you should also know about the European countries that are going to establish what are known as trading companies in Asia, right? Which are the main. European countries that, that trade in Asia, you have Portugal, uh, the Netherlands, you have England, um, are all the three big ones, right? You have the Dutch East India Trading Company and the British East India Trading Company, and we saw uh, Portugal, uh, the Portuguese ex uh, 
with the segment from Silence that we watched with the, with the Christianity and the missions uh, work of the Portuguese, right? So once Columbus discovers the existence, why is it not on over here? Sorry, my mouse and my computer's being annoying. Um, so once Columbus ex ex discovers the existence for, for Spain and opens up the Colombian exchange, um, you're going to have all of these different products that are going to be, be brought back and forth now. Uh, and again, the Columbian Exchange and the, the Columbus's journey is arguably one of the most important historical events uh, for, in a very, very, very long time, for sure. Um, so you're going to have things going back and forth, right? Examples of products uh, that are from the Americas that changed Europe. Things like corn, tobaccos, to pit tomatoes and potatoes, right, and beans and all of this stuff. My cat is derping on my my arms here, um, with his big goofy face on. Uh, anyway, you have other things coming from Europe to the Americas. Things like livestock, right? They didn't have a lot of the same farming animals. Uh, diseases. You're gonna have certain grains and things and wheat. Uh, you're gonna have horses brought over, right? The big diseases that we talked about. Uh, in particular, is this this whole idea of smallpox, which is going to be responsible for killing, you know, ninety plus percent of the Native American population in the New World. Um, pretty crazy if you think about it, right? And they're gonna many of them are gonna die. Uh, they didn't have natural immunities to this. So even though the initial thought is to use Native Americans as slaves, uh, when that's not really possible because of how quickly they're all dying from the epidemics, uh, you're going to have the African slave trade brought to the New World, right? Uh, because Africans have a natural immunity to to those things, right? Those diseases, they also have um, natural immunities to some of the tropical diseases. So anyway, slavery thus is kind of based off of race, right? So uh, you're going to have now what's known as the triangular trade, right? And the triangular trade is going to be this triangular pattern, these three points between the New World, uh, Europe, and Africa. And along this, you know, in, in England to Africa, you're going to have manufactured goods, things like guns, uh, certain other things, right? Um, from Africa to the Caribbean, in many cases, is going to be slaves specifically, right? Uh, and then from the Caribbean and the other Americas to England, you're going to have natural resources, uh, raw goods, right? In some cases, raw rum, uh, sugar, and molasses, tobacco, eventually cotton, and things like that, right? So raw materials that are exported out of Mexico and uh, Mexico and South America, you have things like silver and gold. If you remember back to our mercantilism game, Mexico was one of the gold-producing nations, right? Uh, and then the technology that's introduced to Africa is going to be guns, right? Uh, and if you remember also, we talked about the middle passage being that center leg of the triangular trade, that Africa to the Caribbean, these slaves were brought across the middle passage, uh, and you're going to have uh, millions of slaves actually brought across over the course of, of the slave trade between, you know, opening it up in the 1500s all the way till um, essentially the middle of the 1800s. So, let's go to our empires fast. We're getting getting closer here. So we have the Ottoman Empire, which is going to have be located in Asia Minor, right, which is modern day Turkey. Uh, the event that caused the Ottoman Empire to emerge as a political and economic power is their uh, conquering of Constantinople, right, in the year 1453, which sets off the whole trading thing because the Europeans can no longer kind of peacefully go through this area, right. So. Where did they extend to? They end up in Southeast Asia, uh, down the Balkan Peninsula, which is modern day uh, Serbia and Croatia and, and such. Uh, you're gonna have Southwest Asia and Northern Africa. The main capital is located, uh, it ends up being Constantinople, uh, and the city will eventually be renamed Istanbul. It's not something that's gonna be happened uh, immediately, but yes, eventually it's gonna be named Istanbul. Uh, the religion, you know, Islam, uh, the Muslim religion, is going to be this unifying force of the Ottoman Empire, and it's going to uh, help it spread uh, around the world. You're also going to have a bit of acceptance of other religions, 
Uh, there are 50 questions on the test for sure. Uh, so the two trade goods you should know about for the Ottoman Empire are simply coffee and ceramics. That's pretty simple. So let's go to the Mughal Empire, which is your other uh, other Islamic empire, right? So the Mughals are located in modern-day India, right? Uh, they are also an Islamic group. Uh, their ancestors are, are actually the Mongols, which are hopefully you know of them and learned about them in World History One. Uh, so though, although the Mughals conquered much of India, uh, the south southern part is going to kind of remain independent. Uh, sorry again. Um, you're going to have the Taj Mahal built uh, under the Mughals, this renowned architectural site which we talked about. And the three countries that are going to kind of compete for trade here, uh, as we said again, right, are the three with the trading companies. Uh, well, Portugal isn't really a trading company, sorry. Uh, but you have England, the Netherlands, uh, and such, right? So they're going to compete for trade in the Indian Ocean. Uh, you're going to have the textiles coming out of southern India, which is cotton, wool, and silk. Uh, and they're going to have an influence in, in England uh, and such. So let's move to China and our last page here, I think, which is pretty good. So we're moving, moving along pretty quickly. So you have China, right? And you have these foreign enclaves, which are China's attempt to kind of control trade with Europeans to bring it only through one port in particular, right? And the Europeans are, are going to demand the two certain goods in particular from China, things like porcelain and tea. Uh, we talked, uh, we saw a little bit about the opium wars. We're going to get to that in a bit more depth later on. Uh, and, and England essentially controlling, controlling uh, trade in China and also in, in India for a long period of time. So Japan, we talked about the Tokugawa uh, regime. We talked about how the emperor was more or less powerless during this time uh, and it was controlled by the Tokugo, Tokugawa shogunate, right? Uh, Japan had adopted this isolationist policy. They kind of shut themselves off from the rest of the world, right? Uh, so that's important to note. Uh, as far as Africa goes, the main trade things that were going to be kind of exported and imported uh, into and out of Africa uh, is ivory and gold. Uh, you're also going to have uh, corn and peanuts kind of being brought to uh, Africa from, from other places, right? So our last kind of part to this before I'll leave you guys to your own studying and, any, and I'll maybe answer whatever questions you might have for another minute or two. But mercantilism, right, is this concept of European colonial powers um, trying to become self-sufficient because they didn't want to trade with their competitors anymore uh, because if they can trade with just their colonies then effectively they're going to get the upper hand, right? The a whole idea of mercantilism is that colonies exist for the sole benefit of the mother country um, and that economic needs of the mother country, right, are, are the most important. So we talked about the commercial revolution and the need for new monetary systems and new banking systems uh, to be able to kind of handle all of this global trade. So with that, since all of you have been so patient, um, yes, there are there is an extra credit bonus question. Um, so what uh, the question is going to be is what are the names of Mrs. Kipperman's siblings? Okay. Uh, and you'll be able to earn up to two points, and there are four names that you can know. So the four names that you can know uh, are Jessica, Elizabeth, Hannah, and Gabrielle. Okay, so if you know two of those four going into tomorrow or Friday, you will be able to earn two extra points. The thing is, is again, I do know... Uh, that um, I do know that you, there's how many of you are here. I can see how many people are, are here right now. Um, so if I, if more than the number uh, that are watching right now and total video on um, total views and things like that uh, know the answers to this, uh, well, frankly, that I know you guys are talking and telling people that didn't necessarily come uh, and I have reserved the right to revoke extra credit 
questions and points as a result of that. So, uh, mind you, I would for sure um, not share any of the names going forward because, frankly, you'll just be doing yourself a disservice when you lose uh, when you lose the points. So, uh, okay. Anyway, um, that said, if there's any more questions. Uh, I'll take them right now, and if not, I'll leave you guys to your studying and wish you luck going forward. I've got my cat right here. I'm going to hold him up. Ugh, the dog, I don't even know where he is. I'm sorry. He's probably up upstairs somewhere. Next live stream. Um, are there any map questions on the test? You know, I'm, I don't remember. Um, let me see if I can bring it up fast and take a look at it. My cat attacks my arm. <laughs> well, that one hurt, cat. Uh, there's definitely a question or two. that resolve around a map. Yep, there's undoubtedly a map question uh, or two for sure on here. So definitely um, know some of the maps, at least a little bit, uh, and yeah. Uh, I would say that there are definitely questions on the religions. Protestant just simply means, in this case, uh, non-Catholic, Megan, uh, to make it simple. Um, it's, it's groups that have kind of separated from Catholicism. Okay, uh, so if there are no more questions... Although I know you guys are a little bit behind me. Uh, if there are no more questions. Yeah, you need to know about Lutheranism. I just talked to you about it too. So you need to know about it. Um, as far as the average percent, there are no one's taken it yet, Sydney, so I can't really answer that question. All right, folks, I'm going to shut off the stream anyway. If you want to ask some more questions in the chat, I'll stay for another minute or two. So uh, good luck studying, and that's that.